Welcome to Bread and Roses. Hi everyone, I'm Maram Namazi. I'm Afari Bors Puya. We're sorry we haven't been around for a few months. We know you've missed us a great deal, but we're back again with our program. You had a good rest? Not really. No. <laughs> <laughs> in this week's program, we're going to be talking about the vote for independence in Iraqi Kurdistan, Biji Kurdistan. It's very exciting news yes. for us. Yes. We'll also be talking about an insane fatwa of some Hasidic Jews that walk with blindfolds in the airport in case they see immoral and immodest women. Stories to tell. It's very, very interesting. And our slice of life is finally women in Saudi Arabia being able to drive and women activists there saying we won. And interview this week is with Sanal Adamaruko, the president of the Rationalist International. Stay with us, don't go away. Now, there's been a referendum in Iraqi Kurdistan for its independence, and there's been a 92% vote in favor of independence, and over 80% of registered voters voted in this referendum. And took part in the election. Great news, I think, in the whole area of the destabilized environment, Beautiful. where the Islamist and the religious rule in parts, there's war, there's uh, destruction, there's dictatorship. People. And his religious it. government is this beacon of secularism, a, a, a government which actually wants to establish itself by creating an environment for people to be able to express this view. And Kurdistan, Iraqi Kurdistan in particular, has been one of those areas in the last few years that actually people have a, a relative level of freedom. That there are associations, organizations, debates, conferences, you know, women's rights activists freely expressing these views. And that, uh, f for, for, for us to have this beacon of stability in a region and secularism is a great news. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because the governments of Turkey, of Iran, of Iraq, of course, they've started threatening, they've started saying they're going to boycott it, uh, you know, uh, put, put, trying to put a lot of pressure. And they're saying that this referendum is going to destabilize the region. The region is already destabilized. Yes. This is actually something that gives hope and stability to the region. And it's something imagine, everyone needs to support. Imagine Turkey, who's been destabilizing the whole region by arming religious groups, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraqi government, now these are the source of instability and misery in the region when people want to have a government which brings a level of secularism and a, a relative sort of freedom in the region. Suddenly they talk about the destabilization of the region. I mean, this is outrageous. Yeah, and one of the things is, I mean, imagine I went a, a few months ago to the founding congress of enlightenment feminism in Soleimaniye, Iraqi Kurdistan. This is the sorts of things that they're doing and they're fighting for. And, you know, the, the level of fight for women's equality, for example, for secularism, as you mentioned, it's, you know, really a beacon of hope for a lot of people around the world. One of the things we need to do is they're threatening, they're trying to destabilize, they're trying to destroy this beacon of hope. Uh, because it shows that it is possible in the Middle East to have uh, a society that isn't repressive. And it's our duty, I think, to really defend uh, a, a free Kurdistan, an independent Kurdistan. It means a lot to not just people who are Kurdish, but to all of us. Sana Led America, great pleasure to have you with us. We wanted to ask about the Rationalist Conference. Why are you holding this conference annually? Why is it important to do that? We have a lot of organizations and a lot of important people all around the world who are committed and who are doing a lot for the spreading of secularism, the idea that people can, should be liberated out of the shackles of religion. But there should be some kind of coordination of all these kind of people so that we can exchange ideas, exchange our experience, so that we can study from each other. I would always feel that every conference, I personally, 
despite that I'm organizing it, I got a lot of lessons, I studied a lot out of it. And back in 1995, when we had the first Rationalist International Conference in India, we had a lot of people coming, like from Paul Cuts to I mean, the, 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 the topmost uh, I mean, uh, skeptics and rationalists and humanists all around the world have been coming to us. And this has been an opportunity for people to meet across organizations. Not one organization, because since I don't have too much commitment to one uh, brand of rationalism or atheism or, or secularism, I, I, I consider myself part of all the whole movement. So therefore, I try to bring all the people together at one forum so that we can exchange ideas, we can study from each other. Because everybody's experience, everybody's uh, struggle is a lesson for other people and it's encouragement and inspiration for the other people. And they are taking it back to their organizations and that's how we are expanding our experiences into a wider realm. I mean, you're someone who's uh, had to flee even for your life, basically, from India because of your fight for rationalism. Tell us a little bit about what happened. And the other thing you mentioned at the conference was that three of your colleagues, three of your, uh, you know, co-rationalists, have actually been killed in India. So the situation is quite dire, isn't it? Starting from that, it's not three, now four, uh, because three famous uh, rationalists who are associated with our work have been killed since I left India. The Maharashtra rationalist leader Narendra Dabolkar was fighting for an anti-superstition bill in the local assembly and he was almost reaching at it. The, the Hindu organizations, especially the radical Hindu fringe groups, have been so unhappy with him and he was killed point blank. So was the case of Pansare and Kalburgi, a former vice chancellor of a university and a famous rationalist, was killed in the morning somebody visits him and kills. And last month, uh, a, a young ex-Muslim rationalist, Farooq, he was 27 years old and he was writing Facebook posts, very powerful Facebook posts, inspired by people like you. And you can see your picture on his Facebook page. And he was simply slaughtered and killed. So we support his family. I mean, we have raised a fund for his children to grow and um, we have taken care of the, I mean, the whole family's uh, responsibilities. But this is a growing trend in India. In the neighboring Bangladesh, it's well known that, I mean, there have been so many famous free thinkers killed. And in Pakistan, there's a series of murders going on. So the whole of South Asia is a very dangerous place now. But India, as many people would imagine, was not like that. It has been changing. And my problem started not with the Muslim organizations or Hindu organizations, interestingly, uh, because I have been, I mean, I have uh, no special love for any religion because I consider myself a critic of religion, whether it is Hinduism or Islam or Christianity, I have equidistance for all of them. I've been criticizing all the Hindu godmen and gurus and holy men and all the temples I've been speaking about. The, the, the growth of Hindu fundamentalism has been one of the major subjects of my television programs every time. But the Hindus, since they are a divided lot, or, or trying to you know, engulf even atheism as rational or, or part of Hindutva, so I didn't have much trouble with the Hindu uh, organizations per se, except from smaller groups. But when it came to the Catholic Church, things were different. I've exposed a miracle, a small one, I mean, which could, I've done hundreds of them in different places. But this was a miracle which was connected with a, a crucifix, which was, uh, uh, I mean, crying. And the, the, the statue was crying, they claimed. And I found that it was just a plumbing problem and there was a leakage in the drainage and water was going up in capillary action and that was it. And I could, uh, not only that I could find it out, I sent the collected water for chemical analysis and found that the E. coli bacteria level is much, much above than human tolerance level. But I said this in a television program in the evening, prime time, and the bishop wanted it to be stopped. Instead, the channel, they said, we don't stop it. The bishop can join him in the discussion. And that was the whole problem. I was a good debater and the bishop felt that he was humiliated in the debate. And he sent goons outside the studio to attack me. It began that. Next day I heard that 17 cases against me at different places. We have an old blasphemy law wherein the judiciary need not have to interfere. The police officer in full right to keep a person in custody till the case is filed. That's the only crime where it's still existing like that. 
so I don't have a possibility to get bail as per this law, and I, I, they need not take me to a, a, a court of law because I can be protected in police custody for my safety. That's the law. So this is the law they have used. Interestingly, the same Catholic Church is fighting against the same law in, in Pakistan when it is used against Christians. And I stand with them on that point. I mean, I, even if a Muslim is persecuted, I stand with them because I stand for people's... I mean, I oppose Islam as a philosophy. I, Islam, I oppose Hindutva, I oppose Christianity. But if anybody wants to practice their religion, if they're not allowed, as all of us, I would stand with them. So I was standing with the Catholics of Pakistan even now I stand with that, but they don't want to respect my right to criticize their miracle. So I had to flee from the country after three months of hiding, and I had to flee from the country, yeah. What's interesting though at the conference, uh, there's a talk about all, I mean, there's such a rich history of rationalism in India, isn't it? And South Asia as well. And so it isn't just one story, you know, the regression and the religious right, whether it's Hindutva or the Islamists. There's also this huge history of atheism and rationalism. Explain that a bit. See, in India, uh, from, from something like 2,500 years from now, from the Vedic culture was emerging, parallelly, there have been a lot of critics of the system. Especially, they have been having a lot of sacrifices that began from that. A lot of people came out criticizing the sacrifices and the fallacy of that and the meaningless of that. And, for example, the series of people, I mean, perhaps it's not one person who is Charvaka, but perhaps a series of scholars, what they spoke is not really available at this moment because everything is burned down. But there are books criticizing them. There are Upanishads criticizing them. So there are quotations from them, and one has, can, one, we can compile them, we have done it. And that's something like the same kind of language that most of the so-called uh, anti theists would speak at this moment. That was a language that was 2,000 years back. So what do you, I mean, so there is this battle taking place, isn't it, between the rationalists and, and those who are on the religious right. Do you have any hope that things can get better or are they getting worse? I am an optimist on that at this point, especially regarding India. Things are not gone bad in India. I had to suffer, that's a different thing, but I'm still hopeful that India is not going the Iran way. It cannot go the Iran way because we have a democracy. The system has, you know, it's a decentralized democracy. It's, it's, it's working at very effectively at ground root, at grassroots level. So it's, it's any, any kind of government that goes beyond a certain level of oppression, with whether it's political oppression or whether it's religious oppression, and if it shows intolerance, the Indian history shows that they have been thrown off. Like the best example is the emergency. There was political oppression. There was no religious oppression. And nobody thought, I mean, in 1977, the Indian voter is not that uh, uneducated. I mean, they have a real sense. They've seen that there is a change. But a new government could again be changed. So that's still possible in India. So I don't think, for example, even, even now, for example, the pro-Hindu forces in power in India, that's a question which seriously is discussed, I mean, by all rationalists. Do they go a theocratic way later? Is that a prelude of a future theocracy going to come in India? I don't think so. Why? Because uh, even if the, the, the radical Hindu forces were used for the present government to come to power at one side, the main plank of the election was not Hindutva, but development. Anywhere they go, they use the development as a major slogan. And once they come to power, immediately the small groups use that authority that they have uh, obtained then to advance the interests of Hindutva. So, therefore, my feeling is that if they go too close to their dream goals, the next election they'll be thrown out. Therefore, the, this, the government is very, very careful, is my feeling. But the fringe groups, that's the whole problem. In India, we have, for example, for eating beef, people are killed, lynched. And, and the, anybody, I mean, who is carrying a, a, a cow or something like that, or a, an animal which is considered to be holy, Legally, well, I mean, cow slaughter is a punishable offense in most of Indian states. In Kerala, it's not. In Bengal, it's not. Many parts, we can eat cow. 
I can eat cow in Kerala, but if you take a piece of cow meat outside Kerala, I can get life imprisonment. That's that's a law. So, but but when there is a law, if it's a crime, I mean technically if it's a crime, the crime is not considered as a as as, as a question of punishment, but the crowds are taking things in their hand and they decide whether it was meat, whether it was, uh, I mean, beef. So what is to be done? They don't want it to be taken to a court of law. They want enemies to be, uh, I mean, eliminated. So that's the whole problem in India. Not only, I mean, cow meat an issue. For example, man and woman coming closer or people in, 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 in close proximity is not liked by many people. For example, there is an anti-Romeo squad of police in Uttar Pradesh state. There is a monk in, in, the, in the chief minister's chair in Uttar Pradesh. The police has their job. If a couple go hand in hand, they will stop them. What are you doing here? Are you married? Show, me, show us the marriage certificate. If not, why are you going together? These are the kind of questions officially are asked. So there is a tendency of reaction. You know, as I always used to tell, there are two Indias coexisting all the time. One is a modern, progressive India, scientific and, I mean, developing. And the other side, we have a medieval India. And these two Indias are coexisting. There is a permanent clash between these two Indias. The radical Hindu forces are with the medieval India. That's the whole problem. Thank you very much. This week's Insane Fatwa is about a certain sect of Hasidic Jews that have to go into airports blindfolded so that they don't see immoral women. It might incite them too much. Yes, they have seen blasphemous women, but immoral women. I mean, this is interesting. The photograph is went through social media. The rabbi, of course, the one in front. <laughs> The one in front is not sort of hasn't sort of put the blinders on. But He's the progressive. The I mean, rabbi is the progressive. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, how, how do they get to their seat? Uh, there's another sort of uh, um, video cycling in social media. People are covering uh, Hasidic Jews. This, you know, the extremists are covering TV screens on a on a plane, so it hmm. doesn't show immoral things. It reminds me. In Afghanistan, where a group of uh, Taliban were beating a television, they put it in the middle. <laughs> Yes. With a baseball bat and, and putting just nappies on the donkeys <laughs> so their balls don't show. I mean, there's there's lots of things you could do, but I kind of like this because rather than telling women to uh, wear veils, they blindfold themselves, you know, and keep banging into doors. Maybe it'll knock some sense into their heads. Uh, if they keep it to themselves, it's okay. But the problem is that they enforce it to everybody. Else. Yeah, that's true. But one of the things that people were saying on social media was, how do they get around? It's like bats you know, by echolocation. And someone had said, well, it's going to make me really angry if they get a window seat. <laughs> 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 oh, it's perfect. You know, so the insane fatwas are not just from Islam. Uh, all religions have their insanities, and this is one of them. Now, we've got great news. Women in Saudi Arabia can drive. And, of course, you've got women's rights activists who've been fighting for this for decades. The first time women drove as protest was in 1999, and they've come out and said, we've won. I mean, that's the greatest news for women in Saudi Arabia. There's a lot more to achieve. A lot. You know, and it's, you know, the pressure is working, and it's important every day the pressure on the Saudi uh, government, Iranian government who's barring women from uh, entering a stadium, all of those is a lot to do but the, it, it, this actually says the pressure is working. It works, it works it and works. one of the things that uh, some of the women's rights activists in Saudi Arabia were saying was that they were contacted by security saying that they're not allowed to comment on the fact that women are not allowed to drive so it does have an effect and it's important to support these great women, we're proud of you and we're behind you all the way for all the other fights from ending male guardianship rules, ending compulsory veiling, ending Sharia law ending dictatorship, yada, yada, yada. And getting rid of religious government in Saudi Arabia. We're there with you. Yes.
Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary and yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss table breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.